I'm a bit of a low talker. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Hopefully this will work. Um, thank you, Dan, for your introduction. It's been a great two years, um, two months short of two years in, in uh, Two year, uh, two months. I'll be uh, moving to New York, uh, where I'll have other residents to train. None as good, I'm sure. And um, you know, buy shoes, all those things that attendants do. Um, one of these three does not like to be photographed. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this was at primaries, and it's been an interesting two years. I've learned a lot. Ratna made some friends. Uh, that Grant with his beer fanny pack. <laughs> <laughs> and it's beautiful out here. There's uh, so much to photograph. Uh, this was at Bryce last weekend. And this was right behind the Moran, um, looking at the Ochre Mountains. And I learned how to ski. I thought I start learned how to ski fairly well, but I was wrong. Uh <laughs> <laughs> There's Dr. Vitali. That's the face he makes when I'm doing a vitrectomy. <laughs> kind of, kind of nervous. And here I go off in this sled of shame. <laughs> My doctor says I'll be back, and uh, Dr. Crandall says that if I, if I, and I, and I quote, and um, pardon the uh, rudeness, but he says if I present some retina crap, uh, he'll let me come to uh, his meeting and uh, ski. <laughs> So, um, I'll be talking about uh, diagnostic issues in sarcoidosis. Um, some of you may know I have a background in ocular immunology um, in, in a life before retina. And um, this is a particularly challenging disease and I find that making the diagnosis um, is, is, is difficult. Um, and it's, uh, as ophthalmologists, we're often the first line in making the diagnosis. Sarcoidosis, the ophthalmic manifestations often come first. Um, I'll start with a case that I saw back in residency in Virginia. Not much to do with retina, but a lot to do with sarcoidosis. This is a 37-year-old lady referred for a month of uh, painless vision loss in the left eye. And uh, her past medical and ocular history are unremarkable, as was her review of systems. Um, Visual acuity, however, not so great in the left eye at 2200. And she has a 1.5 log afferent pupillary defect in that left eye. And you can see um, there's an abnormal left optic nerve, uh, a lot of pallor, and abnormal constriction of the visual fields in the left eye. The right eye seems to be normal. Laboratory studies that were performed at the time by our neural ophthalmology service included ANA, ANCAB, Bartonella, ESR, a lumbar puncture that was negative for cell count, protein, and cytology, uh, a PCR that was uh, negative for both <coughs> HSV and a VCV, sorry for the omission, um, ACE and lysozyme uh, specifically were normal. A high resolution chest CT was also normal. This is the MRI, you see this diffuse infiltration and enlargement of the left optic nerve extending into the prechiasmal left optic nerve, right optic nerve being fairly normal. She was administered IV solumedrol, started on a taper of oral prednisone, her vision got better, and she was discharged with improving visual fields on prednisone 2100 with instructions to return in one week. She didn't. Um, she came back in a year um, with worsening vision in both eyes, fluctuating vision in the left, no light perception in the left eye, and a 1.8 log afferent pupillary defect in 2020 in the right eye. Visual fields completely dark in the left eye and starting to develop a superior and inferior arcuate scotoma in the right eye. Very worrying. So with little left to lose in the, in the left eye, uh, our neuro ophthalmologist, uh, who does some orbital surgery too, elected to do an optic nerve biopsy uh, 
Uh, this is the uh, MRI. You see enhancement of the left optic nerve and now enhancement of both the left and the right prechiasmal optic nerve. Very engorged, enlarged optic nerve with lots of vascularity. And a biopsy, uh, I was lucky enough to get the slides from our pathologists, and you see these non Jesuitan granulomas. And this is the diagnosis of extrapulmonary sarcoidosis, sarcoid optic neuropathy. But what's interesting here and what highlights the difficulty in making this diagnosis is that the chest CT was normal, the lab testing was unremarkable, there were no other stigmata of systemic sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis comes in many flavors. Uh, this is a patient in California with a <coughs> granulomatous anterior uveitis, very fulminant. Patient here with uh, choroidal nodules in both eyes uh, it turned out to be sarcoidosis. This patient was asymptomatic. Sarcoid can present with a serpiginous, a macular serpiginous type appearance with these uh, very scary looking infiltrates in the macula. Subretinal fluid can mimic posterior scleritis with uh, these RPE level tiny little nodules. When you see this, it's almost always sarcoidosis. In this patient, and these are uh, this is a classic example of optic nerve granulomas. It can present as a vasculopathy, and although it's been reported to primarily present as an, a, a perivenular vasculopathy, this is a patient who presented with a branch retinal artery occlusion in one eye, and then one year later, with a branch retinal artery occlusion in the other eye, proved to have sarcoidosis. This is an interesting patient from San Francisco who elected to get a Mayan eagle tattooed to her arm. And uh, unfortunately, not quite the results she'd hoped for. It enlarged, she has this big scar granuloma. And interestingly, every time she has this scar granuloma flare up, she develops this posterior uveitis, um, a choroidopathy, an inflammatory choroidopathy. And she could predict when her uveitis was about to flare by a span of one week when her tattoo would enlarge. <coughs> and when I treated her with Remicade, her tattoo never uh, thickened again. Interesting. And scar granulomas have been described in sarcoidosis. So to summarize, sarcoidosis is a multi-system chronic inflammatory disorder of unknown etiology. Ophthalmic manifestation, I can't stress this enough, often, is the, uh, often comes first. It's often the tip of the iceberg. It's often the first thing that the patient is diagnosed with. And so it's important for us as ophthalmologists to make that diagnosis. Characterized by non caseating granulomas, 30 to 60% of patients with sarcoidosis develop ophthalmic changes. Bilateral granulomatous intraocular inflammation is uh, frequent, although uh, a large number of patients have uh, non granulomatous uveitis as well. It may occur in the absence of apparent systemic uh, involvement. That doesn't mean that systemic involvement will not occur. Only one third of patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis have symptoms. Only uh, and two thirds of radiographic abnormalities, so bilateral hyaluronopathy, may resolve. And what's important uh, to take home from this slide is that pulmonary and extrapulmonary manifestations may be temporally discrete. You may have uveitis one day, that may resolve, and then you resol develop pulmonary abnormalities. But what's more important is that when you see a patient with uh, uh, uveitis, you work him up with a chest x-ray, and you don't find bilateral hyaluronic adenopathy, it may have been there once but disappeared. Um, so the chest x-ray, although is, is pretty good for finding adenopathy, may not pick it up at that particular time. So a group of very smart people led by Dr. Narsing Rao got together and um, came up with a, 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 a series of clinical signs, laboratory investigations, and biopsy results, and provided us with four diagnostic criteria of sarcoid uveitis. And what was interesting about this consensus panel was that they came up with a list of clinical signs that they felt was suggestive of sarcoidosis and warranted further um, 
validation. These were granulomatous steratic precipitates, granulomas or nodules, kepi nodules on the iris rough, nodules on the face of the iris, trabecular meshwork nodules, more common than you, you would think, you never look for them, tent-shaped PAS when these resolve, purple and pyrosinesia, snowballed or string of pearl um, vitreous opacities, My macro aneurysms in the presence of vasculitis, punched out PRP-like choroidal lesions, optic nerve granulomas, um, perivasculitis, sp specifically perivenulitis with candle wax dripping like uh, infiltrates with perivascular clustering of choroidal nodules thought to be particularly uh, indicative. The laboratory tests that they suggested be done include energy or, or assessing for energy. In this country, uh, <coughs> candidal energy can be used, but in countries uh, such as where I'm from, uh, where you get a, a, P, uh, a, a DCG, a negative uh, PPD or Monte skin test in the presence of DCG inoculation. ACE and lysozyme, chest x-ray and CT testing was thought to be uh, useful. Abnormal liver enzyme test based on a report previously that said that almost all po patients with sarcoidosis get small granulomas in the liver. Um, and th they thought, a lot of the uh, panel thought that this was going to be useful. And as far as the diagnostic criteria categories are concerned, they came up with definite, presumed, probable, and possible sarcoidosis, where definite involves biopsy evidence and a compatible uveitis, and possible uh, in, in involves a negative biopsy, four suggested clinical signs, and two positive lab tests. Presumed and probable involve uh, uh, radiographic evidence or suggestive clinical signs, but no biopsy attempted. In an attempt to validate some of these ocular findings, this group in Japan um, looked at 50, not a very large number, but 50 biopsy-proven uh, patients with sarcoidosis. And they found this, that, and they compared them with 320 inflamed control eyes, so patients with Bichette and other vasculitis, et cetera. Um, they found that more than half of the patients were biopsy-positive Sarcoidosis and associated uveitis had uh, more than four positive clinical signs. So this as a test, a clinical examination as a test, seems to be pretty good. Moreover, uh, they, f uh, they looked at each of these signs individually for positivity within these 50 patients. And they found that bilaterality is almost the rule. So if you see a unilateral uveitis, uh, it might not be worth your while to get ACE and lysozyme. Um, otherwise, the positivity of all of these signs is greater than the positivity in the, in the control uveitis. Bear in mind, though, that there were 320 control uveitis cases and only 50 sarcoidosis cases. Similarly, when the lab uh, values were looked at, um, Almost 89% of these patients had, um, or 34, had a negative DB test. Um, it's unclear which ones of these were uh, DCG inoculated. ACE and or, and or lysozyme were elevated in 62%. Hilar adenopathy was seen in 72 and chest CT imaging proved abnormal in 86%. Liver tests proved to be, at least in this cohort, not a useful test. Earlier on, looking at an earlier um, iteration of the same uh, workshop on sarcoidosis, uh, this group in 2008 looked at 100 biopsy-proven patients with uh, sarcoidosis, and it compared it with 147 non-sarcoid patients with various forms of non-infectious uveitis. And they looked at uh, uh, examination as, as, a, as a test for the disease. And they found that when, um, when two or more of these um, six 
criteria for diagnosis of osteosarcoidosis were positive in, on examination, then the sensitivity of examination as a test for sarcoidosis was 84%, the specificity was 83. Um, my problem with the study is that um, the validity of this, the sensitivity and specificity numbers cannot be discerned when you read the text because I really haven't talked about the specific numbers of people with each specific sign. Um, what's interesting is uh, retinal periphabitis uh, with perivascular nodules category four was actually fairly specific. So if you see that, uh, go further in your testing. So I'm going to go through the various lab diagnos di diagnostic tests that we use as ophthalmologists in sarcoidosis. Uh, I'm, I doubt any of us really use energy anymore, but ACE and lysozyme, um, it's useful to discuss these. ACE is elevated in 60% of patients with uh, biopsy-proven sarcoidosis, in some studies as high as 70. Um, but do bear in mind that uh, this test measures not the, uh, the enzyme itself, not the presence or the quantum of the enzyme itself, but it measures its activity. It's an enzyme activity study. So if a patient is on ACE inhibitors, don't bother getting the test. If the patient is a child, don't bother getting the test either because almost universally in children, ACE will be high. Lysozyme. In some studies, elevated perhaps a little more frequently in biopsy-proven sarcoidosis than ACE. Uh, and in this study with biopsy-proven pulmonary sarcoidosis, serum lysozyme levels were elevated by 80%. Only 25 patients, but more so than ACE levels. And lysozyme closely parallels improvement in pulmonary function. Uh, once again, a small study, and this, I this is lysozyme levels in pulmonary sarcoidosis, a much larger structure than the eye. So in isolated ocular sarcoidosis, this may not hold true. Lysozyme, however, may be positive, such as ACE may be, in TB, leprosy, osteoarthritis, and pernicious anemia. The first two uh, hold true for ACE as well, so it should be ordered with caution, and a good medical history is important. Energy, as I said, uh, negative responses to uh, subcutaneous antigens, useful in some studies as, uh, as frequent as 90%. Um, of patients with uh, ocular sarcoidosis exhibit some form of energy. And as far as imaging is concerned, uh, the two more most common ones are chest CT imaging and ch uh, chest x-ray. Now, now radionuclide uh, techniques, I, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've used this uh, in diagnosing sarcoidosis and, and looking at my UVIS patients. And uh, I find that it has been useful in perhaps two cases where uh, biopsy sites have been identified, one uh, in the skin um, and one uh, in the lacrimal gland. Chest x-ray, um, bilateral hyaluronidopathy is what is seen in between 59 and 89 percent of patients. Uh, the chest x-ray is abnormal, and that speaks when you have atelectasis, interstitial pulmonary uh, issues in between 85 and 95 percent. It is, however, a poor way of evaluating interstitial pulmonary disease. And as I had mentioned before, abnormalities, radiographic abnormalities, specifically chest x-ray abnormalities, may be transient and may not occur at the same time as your ocular abnormalities. Chest CT is uh, a better, though far, far more expensive way of evaluating the lungs for uh, sarcoid sarcoidosis complications. And lymphadenopathy is visible in 86 to 94 percent. It's also better than the uh, chest x-ray for evaluation of the lung parenchyma, most uh, likely because it, it is a better way to assess the mediastinum uh, and the axillary regions. Um, Speaking to the pulmonologists, uh, they recommend for evaluation volumetric scans, which are uh, today's spiral scans with high resolution cuts, so two different sequences, 
look at the mediastinum and the lymph nodes and the, and the pulmonary hilum, and then also look at the infestation, um, the lung parenchyma. The American Thoracic Society suggests that um, CT be performed in these three instances uh, when you're suspicious for sarcoidosis. Atypical, clinical, or chest radiographic findings, detection of complications that are superimposed on uh, infectious pulmonary issues or, mil uh, or neoplastic pulmonary issues. A normal chest radiograph, when you see it, have a normal chest x-ray but have strong clinical suspicion for sarcoidosis, and based even on your ophthalmic findings, a chest CT is probably indicated. Uh, the older imaging technique involving radionuclides includes, uh, I I is, uh, would probably be gallium citrate scanning. It's useful for localizing involvement. One must be cautious, however, that the just because you see increased uptake in the lacrimal glands does not mean you have sarcoidosis. 25% of pa patients without sarcoidosis have increased uptake in their lacrimal glands. I've used this test once, um, and that was only to uh, look for lacrimal gland involvement. Uh, and, and it's fairly useful. The pulmonologists use uh, fluorid deoxyglucose PET for uh, assessing uh, the activity of pulmonary fibrosis because, as you know, that can be fairly static, but not very frequently used by active ophthalmologists. Which takes me to biopsy. Um, as ophthalmologists, we can uh, contribute to, pa to patient care by finding uh, sites to biopsy. And uh, the lacrimal gland is uh, one structure that has been concentrated on for the last 20 years when people have been looking for ocular sarcoidosis. Conjunctival biopsy is a controversial topic. Uh, vitreous tap is something emerging, the first uh, meaningful publication on that was in the middle of last year in the Journal of Ophthalmology. Bronchoscopy, you refer to the pulmonologist when you think there's an issue. Sarcoidosis can affect the lacrimal gland fairly frequently. Uh, this is a case in JAMA in 93 where there was gross involvement of the lacrimal gland and biopsy was performed making this diagnosis. Uh, why the lacrimal gland? Well, uh, the Incidence of keratoconjunctivitis sicca is between 7 and 16 percent in sarcoidosis, so fairly high, higher than the uh, general population. And gallium scanning demonstrates lacrimal gland involvement or uptake <coughs> in 80 percent in 53 to 61 of 61 <coughs> patients in this study. And really, uh, even in the absence of involvement, because in that same study, enlargement was only present in 10 percent. Now, as a test for sarcoidosis, lac lacrimal gland biopsy has a pretty poor record uh, in this study and others. But when there is enlargement, 60% in four of seven uh, showed positive biopsy findings. So uh, in conjunction with gallium scanning and in conjunction with orbital imaging, it might be a good way to make the diagnosis. The same group talked about 100 patients in whom they did a lacrimal gland biopsy at in the office uh, by having the patient adduct and infraduct and taking a piece of the apex. Uh, they report no complications. Um, they did Schirmer's tests on everybody afterwards. Um, conjunctival biopsy, as I said, is controversial. It, whether or not it's a valid way of looking for sarcoidosis is up in the air. Um, but in this, uh, paper in 77 with 100 conjunctival biopsies in patients with already histologically confirmed sarcoidosis, a positive biopsy was present in 33%. And this, these authors report independence or, or report that biopsy positivity was independent of the presence of nodules and follicles. Um, this even earlier, th th sorry, this later study uh, demonstrated biopsy positivity in 19 of 34. In this particular uh, series of cases, they found that um, conjunctival biopsy was more likely to be positive in patients with ocular abnormalities consistent with sarcoidosis. 
And if the patient had follicles, they were more likely to have a positive biopsy, 80%. In China, they looked at a blind conjunctival biopsy, blind bilateral conjunctival biopsy in patients with ocular features, and they found positivity in 33% irrespective of the presence of follicles. And most recently, um, I believe it was uh, July in 2012, um, this group in Japan looked at vitrectomy specimens where uh, a number of eyes with, uh, 15 eyes with definite biopsy proven elsewhere, uh, sarcoidosis, uh, had their vitreous analyzed for CD4, CD8 ratios. Uh, and this ratio was 70. Uh, 70 to 1, so really high. And they compared it to uh, patients with, 27 patients with inflamed control eyes, so non-sarcoidosis inflamed eyes. And this ratio, the CD4 to CD8 ratio was 2. So although this wasn't a very large study, um, there was a significant difference between the CD4 and CD8 ratio. So maybe vitrectomy and perhaps even anterior chamber tap in an inflamed anterior chamber may be a useful way to look for or to increase your suspicion for sarcoidosis. And lastly, don't be scared to send a patient to a pulmonologist. If you see by uh, hilar adenopathy and interstitial pulmonary disease, um, these guys are pretty good at finding uh, uh, biopsy specimens. 46% yield in blind transbronchial needle aspiration biopsy and what people tend to do more of now is ultrasound guided and endobronchial um, bi needle aspiration biopsy, 86% positivity in this very large study. So I guess uh, the question begs to be answered, why make the diagnosis? Why do we go through all these lengths to make this diagnosis of sarcoidosis? Well, first of all, um, as ophthalmologist, you may be the first person seeing the disease. You may be the first person to make the diagnosis. And this has uh, ramifications on patient systemic prognosis. Um, you know, if you have sarcoidosis affecting the eye, if the patient comes in with breathlessness, you're less likely to shrug it off and say it's just old age. Um, it has prognostic implications in ocular inflammatory disease. Uh, patients with sarcoidosis are more likely to have chronic disease, more likely to have chronic vascular uh, insufficiency, ischemic retinopathies, uh, cystoid macular edema, and are more likely to require immunomodulatory therapy. Now with the, uh, uh, w there's, there was a biologic, the clizumab, that is no longer available, uh, but it was very specifically, uh, it was very useful in patients with sarcoidosis, and that, and when patients were diagnosed with that, uh, the guys at Asthma Institute would often start them on that clizumab. Now with the absence of that drug, it's no longer available, there will be other systemic immunomodulatory agents that are specifically targeting uh, sarcoidosis. So um, once pathways are identified that can be targeted in this disease, this will be a useful, it will be very useful to make this diagnosis. And lastly, a, a real world medicine thing. Um, if you have a patient with an ocular diagnosis, you're far like less likely to get approved for systemic immunomodulatory treatment. You're far li less likely to uh, get insurance approval for uh, a biologic, for instance. So um, for insurance purposes, it's important to make this diagnosis. Ocular features of sarcoidosis have been identified, but statistical validation of these features <coughs> are not yet adequate. The way we'd like to we like to practice is if ocular features are suggestive of sarcoidosis, and you have bilateral disease, then order the first line test. Do not order the test if you have a unilateral recurrent alternating non-granulomatous non uveitis because your pretest probability is awfully low. Um, biopsy easily accessible sites if possible. This helps make, uh, make your diagnosis. Feel free to send the patient to the dermatologist or the pulmonologist to make uh, further assessment. And consider further uh, testing only if primary tests are negative and clinical suspicion still exists. Uh, although the IWS criteria are not validated, it's useful 
if you see two or more signs, uh, clinical signs of osteosarcoidosis, to have a rather low threshold for obtaining at least a chest CT and po possibly a pulmonology consult. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Acharya uh, in California and Dr. Vardali for their help and the photography team that Moran, uh, UCSF, and UVA, you guys should sign your work. Um, thanks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. They didn't mention that. Uh, however, sarcoidosis is often bilateral onset um, and it's often asymmetric. So the symptoms may be unilateral, but if you look hard enough, uh, you may find uh, uh, signs or at least some uh, cell or in inflammatory stigmata in the other eye as well. It is, it, it, that's a good point, but remember that uh, I don't think we should be, uh, have a knee-jerk uh, response to it. We should not immediately order ACE and lysozyme for every patient who comes in with, with uveitis, because if you do that, I mean, it's not a very good test. You know, 62% means it neither rules in nor rules out the disease. Um, and, you know, having a test that you can do little with or a test that makes you order very, very expensive follow-up tests, uh, you know, it may not be a good idea until you're sure it's necessary. Yes. So, <coughs> it's a, a fascinating disease, uh, but, and the other interesting part about it is, is that we obviously look at those that are symptomatic with different folks, and yet, uh, you mentioned in Fisher's, uh, I think there's a huge burden on it for those folks who are asymptomatic with It's important not and to. And you haven't reviewed. And yeah, that's right. That one question you had, you had start, start for. So uh, it, 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 it is very fascinating to know, you know how large it is and this huge burden that, that never pops forward mm -hmm. because of the fact that uh, we, we still never have any clinical proof. I would say it's fairly high. There was a very uh, small study that uh, showed a very large number of patients with, uh, or large proportion of patients with intermediate uveitis uh, who had no symptoms at all. So they were referred by their pulmonologist for uh, evaluation of their eyes. And sure enough, there was, uh, you know, a cell in the anterior, chim anterior vitreous. And would you treat that? No, absolutely not. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.